free to uh, what you call it, uh, unmute your microphone and share your idea. The question is that, what is statistics? What do you think? What is the statistics? You join to this two days workshop to learn a statistic, but first of all, we need to know what is a statistic actually? Hello? Any idea? Statistics is um, scientific methodology to analyze data and uh, acquire some insights to make a good decision. I am Vijay from science faculty. Thank you. OK, very good. Anything else you want to add? No idea. There are more than 70 people, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, almost 73 people here. So anybody else wants to add to the definition of a statistic? Can I ask you, you talk about data collection. Where, what is the source of data? Where usually we collect data from? From experiment. Experiment is one source of data, right? Anything That's else? My survey. Survey. Okay, you do survey from where? Uh, from person, people. People are from where? From a sample. Sample. Okay, sample from where? <laughs> a population. House, okay. Household or a company? Yes, correct. So we have a population. We do sampling, we collect data through a sample, and then we analyze the data, we come with conclusion or information, and then at the end of the story, what we do with this information? To test no. our hi hypothesis. To test our hypothesis is correct. Anything else? We represent the population. Okay, that's great. So we... the main the main reason that we do a statistic, actually statistic is a science and knowledge and art of collecting data from a population through a sample, analysis of data, generating information, and finally we try to inference and generalize our information to the main population, right? So let me to draw this flow chart. So let you can see my screen, right? Not yet. You have a population. Not yet, bro. No. 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 Okay. Thank you. Let me to share again. Okay. Now. So I think you can see my screen now, right? Yes. Yes, bro. Yes, now. Okay. So we have we have a population, correct? And then we do a sampling. We collect data. Sorry, it's difficult for me to write down with using mouse. I don't have any smart pen, so that's why we collect data. We analyze the data, we cook the data. We generate information, and then we try to inference this uh, information to the population. Actually, the art of a statistic is that here, yeah. inferencing of results or generalizing of your information from a sample to the population. So can I ask you why we need to do the sampling, why we don't study the whole population. Maybe the population is too big that uh, you cannot reach everyone of the population. Of course, sometimes the population is too big and it's impossible to collect data from the whole population. And if it's possible, then you need uh, uh, what you call it to uh, it's costly. And you, of course, you need a uh, huge amount of money and time correct it's time consuming process and that's why suppose that if you concentrate on malaysian people 
the total, uh, what you call it, population is roughly around 33 million, right? So can I collect data from 33 million people? Yes, but I need huge amount of money, manpower, and also the time. So the reason that we go through the sample and we do collecting, collecting data based on a sample because of these two factors. Agree? Sometimes population is not accessible. You, can't, you cannot access to the population. That's why you do the sampling. Okay, when you cook, when you collect data, remember data and information are two words, terms, that unfortunately some of the researchers or students I saw that they use it in a wrong way, wrong place. Data means the raw information, actually. This is the raw data, raw material, correct? When we cook it, we convert it to the information. You collect data, this is a raw material, and then you generate information through analysis process. And this is called, what you call it, outcome or results. The analysis, Today, actually, of course, we concentrate more on this kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it, techniques or method of analysis of your data. But the statistic is the whole process. So, of course, when you collect data from a sample, the results or information are not 100% accurate in terms of, uh, what do you call it, comparing to the population, right? Always there is a bias. Agree? Okay. Yes. Can you tell me how we can measure? Okay, if your bias or your error is low, then your confidence to generalize this information to the population will be high, right? If the error is low, so the confidence is high. So the art of a statistic is that we are able to calculate this error. Do you know what we call it, this error in this process? What do we call it? This error, this error is sampling error. Okay, never mind. Maybe some of you, I'm sure that 100% of you are familiar with this term. This is called actually P value. Right? So we use p-value to generalize our information to the population. And I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this term. Of course, if the p-value is less than 0 0.05, what do you say? If the p-value less? Significant. Yeah. You use the term of significant. And when the p-value is above 0 0.05, you use this term, not significant. Many people, unfortunately, they don't understand the concept of the p-value. The p-value actually is the amount of your error or bias, because we know that the, when we deal with the sample, results always are biased. It's not accurate, right? So when we want to inference these results and when we want to generalize our results to the population, we need this amount of error or bias. And that bias actually can be estimated through the p-value. If the p-value is high, so means you have a lot or huge amount of bias. Then it is not recommended to inference your results of the population, right? And if the p-value is low, means your error is low, your bias is low. So means you have enough confidence, correct, to inference or generalize your information to the population. So that's why when we say significant, results are significant, it means you have enough confidence to generalize and apply your information that you get from your sample to the population. And if results are not significant, it means there are, what do you call it, 
there are not enough adequate confidence or there is huge amount or uh, what you call it high amount of bias among your results that you have collected through the samples. And the art of a statistic is that all the statistical analysis that we work on it later are those techniques that generate at the end of story p value. The story behind all the statistical tests is in order to calculate the p value. Clear? Yes. 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 So you need to understand the concept of a statistic rather than the techniques. To be honest, within two days, I'm not able to cover all different aspects of a statistic. So what I'm trying to do within these two days, I try to, what do you call it, uh, give you the right, uh, what do you call it, information and basic information in terms of a statistical analysis. But people's, I, I, I have met some people at the PhD level, when I ask them what does it mean significance and not significance, they are not able to express and explain the, 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 the meaning of the significance. <laughs> Correct? This is the critical issue. We need to understand that significance is the amount of your confidence to generalize your information. Because always when we do a study, correct? We do most of our studies actually are based on sampling. So when we do the sampling, of course the data and results can be biased. And the statistical techniques and methods will let us know how to calculate this p value. Clear? Yes. yes, but remember, yes. there is another critical point that I want to highlight for you. The significance can be used if your sample is a representative sample. Can someone tell me what does it mean, representative sample? When we say representative sample, what does it mean? A sample that represents the population. Okay, a good understand. sample number, a number, I mean, a, a number, um, a sample or essential number of samples that will be able to represent the whole population. Okay. One, one, of, one factors that affects on representativeness of a sample uh, from a population is the sample size, of course. So it means we need to collect adequate number, right? Other things is sampling a scheme or techniques or method. So how, how did you collect your data? There are two techniques in sampling. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with random sampling and non-random sampling, probable sampling and non-probable sampling, right? So if you, if you select your, even, even in experimental uh, studies, if you select your subjects, uh, what do you call it, uh, without considering this random distribution, then the, the, the study can be, the results can be biased. So we need to make sure our sample is representative. Representativeness means each subject, each unit in your population has equal chance to be selected. So if if all the subjects are, they have equal chance to be in your sample, then, then this sample can be called a representative sample. Of course, two things. Remember, size of sample and technique of sampling. So, can I ask you something now? If my sample is not representative, can I use the p-value to inference, to, to interpret my results or not? No, no. So means this is a common issue and mistake among many researchers. When you are using a non-random sample, a non-probable sampling techniques, that, that means your results is not representative. So even the p-value is significant or because the statistical softwares are not able enough, <laughs> are not intelligent enough to, to distinguish whether your sample is random or not random. So if you put data in SPSS or other software, 
When you calculate, for example, ANOVA or T statistic or correlation, of course, you are able to calculate the p-value. But this p-value, can I use it when my sample is not representative? No. So why? Because in non-probable sample, there is no link between sample and population. It is not representative. That's why this information should not be used to be generalized to the population. Right? So means if you have if you are dealing with a non-probable sampling, we have different types of non-probable sampling, convenient sampling, uh, what do you call it? Uh, snowball sampling, uh, quota sampling, judgment sam judgmental sampling. There are different types of non-random sampling. Okay, give you an example. See whether I'm right or not. I'm living in somewhere in sex, uh, in PJ, right? My house area is in PJ. Suppose I collect 450 questionnaire among people in, in that area, and then I, I want to study the socioeconomic status of uh, Malaysian. I collected 450 questionnaires, and then suddenly through this sample, I found that the average income of Malaysian family is 1.23 three million ringgit per month. Is it, can I, can I inference this result to the whole Malaysian? Can I say that, okay, this is the average income of all Malaysian, 1.2 million ringgit per month? Definitely not. <laughs> of oh, course not. Cannot. <laughs> yeah, so remember how this kind of, uh, what it, this is, this is common, as I mentioned that, uh, to be honest for last, at least 13 years that I live in Malaysia and I did a lot of research consultation and analysis for many of postgrad students. I found that this is a common issue. They use non-random sample and then they judge their results using the p-value. The p-value is the sampling error when your sample is a representative sample. When my sample is not representative sample, of course, I just intentionally I just collected data from the PG area in this very small district, and people who live there, all of them are rich. So, of course, the average of the income of those people who live in that area is 1.2 million ringgit per month. But this results has no link, there is no link between this sample and the whole population. Because people who live in Kelantan, in JB, in Malacca, they have no any chance to be selected. Right? So this sample is not representative. So that's why any kind of information from this sample cannot be generalized to the population. Don't do that. So when you don't, when you are, when you are not allowed to generalize information to the population, means you don't need p-value. No p-value. Okay, maybe you ask yourself, okay, what shall I do? Of course. Uh, we have two types of sampling. In some cases, we have to do the non-probable sampling because uh, there are some situations that we cannot do the random sampling, of course. That's why a uh, statistician introduced the second approach of the sampling, which is non-probable sampling or non-random sampling. So if you do the non-random sampling or non-probable sampling, then what you need to do? Okay, can, can someone answer to my questions? What is the alternative? How we can discuss about our results? Based on what? Effect size? Yes, right, effect size. If your sample is not representative, then don't use p-value. Only look at the effect size, and then we will discuss about effect size later in the second day, tomorrow. Correct? So this is very important point. What I'm sharing with you came through, uh, what do you call it, uh, <laughs> a huge amount of, uh, what do you call it, actual and real experience. And to be honest, I have I've seen a lot of articles sometimes, the researcher used non-probable sampling, and at the end of a story, they judge their results based on the p-value, which is totally wrong. Is it clear now? 
Yes. 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 Good. Uh, doctor, so yes. I just summarize this one. So when uh, we are collecting the non uh, non probability uh, sampling, then we have to avoid t value, and then we have to use the effect size. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. So okay, now okay. I want to make another <laughs> challenge here before moving to the stat. I just want to discuss because. For me, as a statistician, uh, for in, in my all workshops, I start my talk with this topic. Because when you don't understand correctly the concept of statistics, a statistic, then you cannot apply it. But first of all, we need to understand what is a the statistic, then you can apply it in the right way. Doctor, if I may ask one question. Please. Um, is there, is there um, um, a reason for us to choose non-probability sampling and probability sampling when we are not able to define the population. Of course, uh, actually that it's out of uh, what you call it the scope for this workshop, correct? So, but uh, there are there are if you Google and if you try to search it, there are a lot of guideline and explanation about the sampling techniques. We have a lot of books, correct? OK, just let give you an example. If you want to collect data among HIV patient, right? Do you access to the all HIV patient? Of course, no. This is unknown. Some of the secretive uh, population. Suppose that you want to study among the hackers, among addict people. So in this case, it is not possible to do the random sampling. Of course, we have to do the non-probable sampling. The point is that you need to understand when you are dealing with a probable sampling, then you can generalize your finding to the population. But when you are dealing with a non-probable or non-random sample, you are not allowed to use the p-value and inference your results of the population. That's all. This is the core of my topics for this morning. <laughs> Clear? All right, doctor. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, now let's move to another challenge. And OK, this workshop is an opportunity for me to uh, what they call it, talk about this two, uh, what they call it, most important point in 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 research, not in a statistic only. OK. So. Uh, please wait. OK, now. So the p-value, the cutoff point for the p-value that you decide whether the results are significant is 0.05. If your result, if the p-value is less, right, always you conclude that there is no significant. So means your error is high. So stop to generalize your results of the population. Or no, if it's less. Am I right? Oh, no one. OK, please remember. When the p-value is less than 0 0.05, your results is significant. So means you have adequate confidence to generalize your results to the population. But when your, your p-value is more than 0 0.05, always we say that our result is not significant. So means we are not allowed to generalize to the population. So means no link between sample and population, right? OK, now I'm going to ask one thing. Suppose in one study results, the p-value was 0 0.049. Is it significant or not? Significant or not? Significant. It's less than 0 yes. 0.05. Yes. Great. The p-value is significant. Thank you very much. And another study, the researcher calculated the p-value as 0 0.051. Is it significant? Not More significant. than 
0.5, so not significant. Not significant. So can you tell me how much is the confidence here? When your p-value is 0 0.049, it means you have 95.1% confidence, right? Am I correct? Yes. So how much is the confidence here? 94.9%. How much is the difference between 95, 1.1% and 94.9%? Only 0.2%. Okay, let's move to another scenario. Suppose that in another study, we have a p-value is 0 0.05. Is it significant? Yes. 0 0.05. Not significant. Okay. Not, not significant. Yeah. How much is your confidence? 50%. 50%. Okay. So look at here. That's a point. I just want to change your mind. So this result is significant and this result is significant, right? Can you tell me this, this result is close to this? or close to the second one? Close to the first one? If you, if you want to group, if you want to classify and group them, of course you group these two values together because they are very close. This and this value are too much different, right? Yes. But surprisingly, when we want to look at the significance, we just, we group them similar. And this is because of this cutoff point. Of course, you have say, you can say that, okay, your answer is correct. Yeah, Dr. Mahmoud, this is 0 0.05, and this is less, this is more, that's all. So the thing is that black and white <laughs> judgment. So we, we have a cutoff point, if it's less, we say significant. If it's more, we say not significant. But today I'm going to talk about uh, what you call it a night. Uh, the yes. question is how can you group 0 0.051 and 0 0.5? Because, no, because, the difference because we don't group them. Actually, I'm saying that when you interpret your results, both of them you say not significant, right? So means All they are right. saying. Okay. I mean, I mean, from from this perspective, they are same. Okay, but but basically, when you look at the value, they are more, much more close. This zero point yes. five one compared to the zero point five. But yes. surprisingly, we judge these two p values similar and these two p value differently because of what? Because of this cutoff point. Why? Because we have a black and white rules. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call it? Guideline to interpret our results. But okay. to be honest, by using this logic, always we are losing information sometimes. Not always, sometimes. Sometimes we, we lose information. Why? Because 94.9% confidence is still, is still is a huge amount of confidence, right? And then we can con we can still uh, inference it to the population. The reason that we stick to 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 because in the old school statistical textbook there was no any computer. A long time ago, I remember when I started learning statistics, there was no any computer to generate the p-value. What we did that time, we calculated only the statistic parameters. And then there was two tables at the end of a statistical book at 5% at 1%. And then we compare it with that tab tables. But because of the uh, advancement in technology, in computer, softwares, now easily you can calculate directly the p-value. You don't need to look at that tables. And each value, each value has its own sound. Significant and not significant is based on classical statistic interpretation. Nowadays, if you ask me, I don't believe at all to that kind of interpretation. 
Okay, still we have to follow them because many journals, many supervisors still want to look at that uh, aspect. But basically, when you have a p-value like 0 0.051, I have still, I have something to say. Am I right? It's not rubbish. It's not the same as the 0 0.05. So still we can, we can discuss and we can talk about this p-value. Have you heard about the fuzzy logic? How many of you are familiar with the fuzzy logic? Raise your hand. Those people who are familiar with the fuzzy logic, please raise your hand. No one. In the 21st century, none of you knows about that. Fuzzy logic. Okay, no, never mind. Uh, give me a few seconds. I want to share with you one interesting video, right? Give me just one second. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, bro. Okay, please, it's almost three and a half minutes. Please spend your, just concentrate on what this guy is talking about. Uh, I forgot his name actually. <laughs> He's one of the famous uh, scientist, physician. I mean, okay, let me to play it. Okay, just three and a half minutes. I'll be back soon. Wait about how much the fuzzy thinking is going on in the world. You know, fuzzy thinking, people are just not thinking straight. Consider this following example. Imagine you have a spelling bee. And this is contrived, but it makes the point. There's a spelling bee, and you have to spell the word cat. Okay. So one student spells it C-A-T. Person got it right. Next person spells it K A T. That's wrong. You got that wrong. Okay. Third person spells it X Q W. You realize that is marked equally as wrong with the K A T? When you could argue that K A T is a better spelling for cat than C. Dictionaries know this because that's how they spell it phonetically. And so we've built a system for ourselves where there is an answer and everything else is not the answer, even when some answers are better than others. So our brains are absent the wiring capable of coming up with an original thought. If you're an employer and two candidates come up looking for a job, and this is, again, a contrived example. And, and you're interviewing the two candidates. And, and you say, oh, as for part of this interview, I just want to ask you, what's the height of the spire on this building? And the candidate says, oh, I was, I, I was, a, I was a, 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 an architect. I majored in architecture for a while. And I memorized the heights of all the buildings on campus. I know the height of that spire is 150 feet. In fact, 155 feet tall. Okay, it turns out that's the right answer. That's the right answer. And the person came up with it in second. That person goes away, the next candidate walks in. Oh, do you know the height of the spire on this building? The candidate says, no, but I'll be right back. The person runs outside, measures the length of the shadow of that spire on the ground, measures the length of her own shadow, ratios the height to the shadows, comes up with a number. 
runs back inside. It's about 150 feet. Who are you going to hire? I'm hiring the person who figured it out, even though it took that person longer, even though the person's answer is not as precise. I'm hiring that person. That person knows how to use the mind in a way not previously engaged. You realize when you know how to think, it empowers you far beyond those who know only what to think. Okay, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fuzzy thinking. Fuzzy thinking is based on the fuzzy logic. And nowadays, uh, the fuzzy logic is going to be, what do you call it, a kind of dominant approach on problem solving, especially AI technology, artificial intelligence, uh, neural networks, many of these approach, new approaches are based on the AI, correct? And all th these are based on the fuzzy logic. So uh, I think we need to revise uh, our uh, previous uh, <laughs> guidelines, right, to, to keep more valuable information. What do you think? Yeah, doctor. So do we need a still black and white <laughs> criteria to identify, to make a decision or no? OK, so just think about it and try to learn more about fuzzy thinking because it's really helpful. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the second wave of uh, what you call it, they call it industrial revolutions is based on the applying this technology, this uh, this concept, this uh, philosophy, this logic. If you, I'm not sure whether you are, have you, have you noticed that in the, some of the new device, they also put the name of the fuzzy. Uh, in the washing machine, if you look at the, at the top, some of them, maybe you notice that there is, they, they, they wrote that washing machine, sorry, fuzzy, fuzzy something. Uh, in the old techniques, uh, in the old generation of the washing machine, there was no any, what do you call it, the concept. No matter how much cloth you put inside the machine, it takes two hours watering, I mean, the electrical, electric consumptions, everything was fixed for two hours. But the new generation adjust the process according to the value or amount of input. So actually, this works based on the fuzzy logic. So uh, I think the fuzzy logic is a logic that can be applied in all different disciplines. There is no limitations. But as a researcher, we need to understand what is that. And back to our topics. And now, if you remember, according to the fuzzy logic, this is not rubbish. This is significant. It means here we don't say significant or not significant. We say here the result is 95.1%. There is 95.1% there is nine, confidence that can this can be happen in the population. And when the value come by 0 0.051 means still by 94.90 confidence. 90% confidence, still there is possibility that these results can be seen in the population. So means we do not, uh, what do you call it, think black and white. You got it? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, <clears throat> um, actually, we, actually, we discuss about these things, but let me to again share with you something. This is just an example, right? Suppose that you want to establish a factory in the Malaysia and then you want to produce shoes for Malaysian people, right? Of course, the capacity of this factory is 900 shoes per year and there are 30 different sizes. Okay, can I say that? Okay, there are 900 capacity, 900,000 and there are 30 different thousand. Then I create uh, what they call it or oh, something wrong with my mouse. I don't know. Can it, can, is it logic that say that, okay, 30,000 per year from each size? Can I just produce 
equals number of shoes for each size? Is it rational? No. Why? Why it's not rational? Because the sample may not be the same sizes. The 90,000 people uh, uh, may not be the same sizes. Of yeah, exactly. Because when in, in the marketing, when you want to do a business, all, of course you need to, uh, what you call it, consider the market demands. And we, know, we don't know what is the distribution of the shoe size among Malaysian people. So in marketing, if you want to maximize your benefit, of course, first of all, you need to know how is the demand. That's why you need to go to the population and calculate and measure the size of the shoes among Malaysian, right? But is it is it possible? Of course, it is possible, but you need to spend a lot of time and money, but the result will be 100% accurate. Actually, this is just an example that summarizes what we have discussed earlier. So the sample is low cost fast, but the results always is bias. And this bias is p-value or sampling error. And this is the sample, correct? OK, that's all for the intro. Now we move to the next topic, which is the definition of the variable, because in a statistic and or what do you call it? Uh, analysis is always we deal with different types of variables. But what is the variable? Variable, if anything can be changed. If something change among your individual in your population, we call it variables. There are two types of variables, quantitative and qualitative. So it's very important for you to understand and to identify the nature of your variables at the beginning. Why? Because all statistical tests can be chosen based on the type of variables. We have some certain type of statistical techniques or methods for quantitative variables and some of the statistical techniques for qualitative variables. Clear? But can someone tell me what is the difference between quantitative and qualitative? What are the quantitative variables? The quantitative variables, the nature, the nature, we represent them by numbers, right? Why the qualitative variables are not numbers? We describe them. Quantitative variables can be can be categorized under continuous and discrete variables. Continuous means uh, the variables, actually the, the quantitative variables are countable or measurable, right? So there are two types, continuous and discrete. Continuous means they can take even decimal numbers. Discrete means only integer numbers. You cannot say I have 3.5 children, right? Only integer numbers. This uh, qualitative variables are those variables that we use words we explain it by some terms, right? Like gender. Gender is a qualitative variables. We say female and male, right? Ethnicity. We say Malay, Chinese, Indian. In terms of residential area, rural area, urban area. So we use the words to explain them. One of my students said, Dr. Mahmoud, in the SPSS we use one and two, so it means we use the numbers. So why you consider it qualitative? It should be numbers because it's quantitative. Remember, these are not numbers, these are codes. We use code. Code is different. Code, we just use it to, to simplify the process of data analysis. Qualitative data can be classified under ordinal data and nominal data ordinal or those variable that among the level among the level of your variable is is an order like education education you say that uh, for example primary school secondary diploma bachelor bachelor master phd so there is an order of course we use the terms we use the words 
to explain the level of this variable, but there is an order. But for the norm, for the nominal data, there is no order. For example, ethnicity. No matter Malay one, two, three, or two, three, one. No matter. There is no order. One, two, gender. For example, gender is one, two, right? Maybe another person zero, one, or one, zero. Of course, if you are feminist, always you give the highest score for the female and the lowest score for male. If you are racist, maybe you just, that's a different story, correct? But basically these variables are ordinal and nominal. Clear? Any question? No questions, thank you. So I think it's very easy. Huh? So the other types of variables, we. We, we categorize it according to the, uh, what do you call it, uh, calculation or computation. Some of the variables directly can be observed or can be measured from a population or sample. Some other variables that we call it secondary variables are those variables that we calculated based on the primary variables. For example, you collect weight and height, and then you calculate the BMI, right? So. You can create some index, some new variables. And the difference between creative researcher and non-creative researcher is that the creative researcher always, they are interested to play around primary observation and variables to generate some new comprehensive, what you call it, secondary variables. So the, if I want to analyze weight and height separately, so the volume of the analysis will be more and it will not cover the whole, for example, the body shape or the body measure. So the person who create this index make it easy for us. And of course, they create some guideline for us. If, if the BMI is less than, for example, 18.5, uh, you are underweight, 18.5 to 25, it's normal and so on, right? So the point is that I just want to highlight this. Please always ask yourself, can you formulate, can you create a formula and can you combine the primary observation uh, variables that you have collected to come with the new, what do you call it, index or criteria? That's a very interesting part. So I remember during my some of my research, uh, basically, from the beginning, I was thinking, what kind of primary variables can I collect through my research that enables me to, 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 to generate more secondary variables? From the beginning, I was thinking about that. So that's why uh, in some of the, my work, actually, uh, you can see a few primary variables, but more secondary variables. And secondary variables are sometimes much more comprehensive. They are uh, including, uh, for example, for me, actually, in my field, since I'm a, I'm a biotechnologist, actually, in, I did some experimental study over the time on cell culture. For example, what I did, I calculated growth rate ratio. I mean, I, I, I play around the variables, time, weight, some of the content in my cells. You know, I play around those variables and create some uh, index. And those index have, were not ex, uh, reported before my research. So please be creative. And a statistic is a way that makes you more creative. As there are some statistical techniques that makes, able you, uh, make able you to create some comprehensive index, uh, like PCA, factor analysis. That's a kind of secondary variable, right? We will discuss in the second day for the factor analysis. Any question? No. No. OK, good. <laughs> I think it's, it's it's very clear, right? <laughs> or no? You don't like it? Clear, sir. It's very yes. clear. OK, thank you very much. So yeah. the last the last part, uh, in terms of definition of types of variables, we can divide the variables into independent and dependent. Of course. Uh, in advanced statistics, sometimes we can add mediator or moderator 
or covariate. There are some other rare types of variable, but I just make it simple for today's workshop, actually. Uh, the independent variables uh, is a variable that researcher can manipulate. Suppose that you want to look at the effect of gender on something, right? On quality. If you want to, then gender can be manipulated by you. What does it mean? So it means you can combine your samples from both gender. A researcher wants to study the different concentration of a certain material on growth rate on some, some cells, right? So then he play around different concentrations, zero, 1%, 2%, 5%, and 10% concentration of a certain, for example, treatments, and then run the, this is independent variable because the researcher easily can manipulate it. The outcome is called your dependent. For example, the quality of life. In this survey, you just concentrate on female and male, and then you measure the quality of life. Quality of life is out of your control, but female and male is under your control. So it means you can include only male or you can include only female or no, you can include both of them in your study. So it means easily you can manipulate this one. These factors are independent and dependent factors, right? I'm not going to confuse you, but remember there are other types of variables that it's out of a scope for this basic and intermediate workshop, always we discuss at advanced level, intervening variable, mediators, moderators. Okay, but basically, actually, the main types of variables, independent and IV and DV. Okay, so. Uh, prof, that means yes. uh, the primary variable can be uh, uh, concluded as an independent and secondary variable no, is no, no. dependent, is it? This, this is different story. Type, oh. Types of this is the, this is, uh, based on their rules. The, the, the maybe when you create a secondary variables, you combine IV and DV together to create a secondary variables. That's different story. Okay. 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 So now it's almost at 10 a.m. We have uh, almost uh, 15 minutes break have a rest and come back at 10.15. Are you okay? Okay, bro. Okay, okay. 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 We, Thank we, you. Okay, no yeah. problem. Bro. We will start, we will start at 10.15. See you then. See you, doctor. Drink a coffee and refresh yourself for the second round. And don't forget mute your microphone during break. <laughs> mm. Okay. Are you ready to start? Yes. Yes. yes okay, good. So let's back to the slides. OK, statistical methods can be divided into two categories, main category, descriptive statistic and inferential statistic. In descriptive statistic, usually we apply them to describe our sample, right? Like frequency tables, central tendency, and dispersion indices. But inferential statistic, as I explained earlier, are those statistical tests that can be applied to calculate p-value. The main reason that we apply this statistical test is to, uh, to be able to inference our finding to the population. So means the final outcome of this statistical test are the p-value. So and then we judge and we decide according to the p-value. There are two different kind of statistical tests inferential statistical test, parametric and non-parametric. So let's start with the descriptive. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with descriptive statistics. The frequency, I think uh, it's very clear. Let me to open my data and then show you something with the data. Uh, suppose that this is your data and then, of course, uh, are you familiar with this PSS? Most of you are not.
Do you know SPSS? SPSS is a statistical oh. package for social science, right? And one more, thing, one more thing that I want to highlight before starting the second round is to uh, inform you there are several types of statistical tools, right? No matter what statistical software are you, you are planning to apply or use in your research. Um, the point is that as long as you understand the statistic, then no matter what kind of software you want to apply, um, there are some, uh, of course, a statistical package, SPSS, you have to buy the license. Some of the uh, softwares are not free. Some of softwares are free. So the one of the famous and common softwares nowadays, which is open source, is R. R is a language of statistics. Of course, for beginner, it, I, do, I do not advise you to start with R. First, you need to understand the statistic with some statistical package uh, like uh, SPSS. And then once you understand the concept of statistic, uh, familiar with terms in a statistic, then you can try to use the R. For the R, you need to know how to do the codings. It's based on syntax. So means you need to write down your syntax. Uh, despite there are many, many packages developed under R uh, software, but basically you need to know how to do the syntax and codings. Uh, some other statistical software like SAS also basically works based on the syntax. Syntax is a kind of programming. Those people who has ability to learn the programming and they are familiar with the programming, the, it will be easy for them to deal with these two softwares. But for many of you, probably it's much easier to uh, what you call it to deal and play around some softwares that you just need to click, correct? Uh, you know, I remember 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago, when I started uh, learning a statistic, there was no any software. And we had to do programming by ourselves under different languages like basic, Fortran, C, and it was really difficult. Even the initial, ver uh, initial version of the SPSS also, it works based on syntax. But nowadays, there are many uh, softwares uh, which have been developed uh, in different disciplines that can easily be applied and you just need to click and find the, the menu and then find, select your variables, select your statistical test and just, just run it. University of Malaya provided a SPSS uh, license, but this license uh, can be used only when you are connecting to the, uh, what do you call it, the, the UM network. I mean, it is only applicable, uh, 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 what do you call it, usable when you are in campus. Out of campus, it won't work. Uh, there are some online softwares. Let me to show you something uh stat to do so a stat to do is another software online software that always i introduce to my students and my clients that when they have difficulties uh, to access some uh, softwares then they can go to a stat to do a stat to do is very a comprehensive stat tools package uh, and that this uh, this website provided many kind of statistical tests. So if you go to the index uh, page, for example, t-test, for example, there are many, many time series, transformation, you know, Toki, many, if you want to go to uh, I, for example, D, according to the data modeling, for example, classification, base probability, even advanced statistical uh, techniques already, analysis of covariance and also the R codes. Uh, this, soft, this platform provides for you a thousand, I think more than thousand uh, types of analysis. If you want to do the meta-analysis for comparison, if you want to do the poison distribution, you know, a sample size calculator. Sample size calculator also is available for survival analysis for 
any, any kind of data, discriminant analysis is correct. So if I, for example, if I want to do correlation coefficient, so the chi-square test, classification, cluster randomization, Cohen calculation, I mean, uh, a lot of stat compare groups, analysis of covariance. If you just go to the uh, ANCOVA, for example, then you can see here the data and R code. So this is example. Then you can just uh, follow the instruction and do uh, apply these codes, convert this data, replace this data with your data, and follow the the guideline and try to analyze the, your data with uh, what you call it stat to do. Um, it's it's very interesting uh, what you call it uh, platform for those people who are not uh, what you call it able to access to any statistical software. For example, pair t test. You go to the program, under program, you just put your data. There are some examples you can follow the examples, and uh, if you want to know more about uh, the pair difference, you go to the explanation page. This is pair t-test, non-parametric Wilcoxon, all the information plus the references uh, are provided by this uh, free, uh, what do you call it, website. And uh, that's why the tools is not the, the, the point. As long as you understand the statistic, easily you can find, uh, what do you call it, some free uh, softwares or Maybe if you have grant, found money, then you can buy some software. The point is that uh, the most important point is understanding the concept of statistical techniques. The tools, you can find it. Uh, so this is one of the, what you call it, useful online uh, platform that you can apply if you want to uh, do analysis. OK, back to our slides and SPSS. In SPSS, actually, it's one of the friendly user softwares. You can include your data, define your variables, and then under analyze, you can analyze uh, what you call it, your data based on your research uh, objective according to the research, uh, I mean, the statistical techniques that you, you, you are you required to apply. Uh, beside that, SPSS also is a very strong tool in data management uh, from missing data replacement, calculation, transposing, merging data, ranking, uh, matching, uh, splitting the file, selection, a part of your data. So uh, under transform, you can, yeah. Anything? Uh, can you mute your microphone? Sorry, when you are not talking, please. Thank you. So under transform, also you can use a lot of options like uh, recording, computing, counting of uh, binding of your data, creating a time series data, and replacing the missing value. Or even you can create and produce some random numbers. Right later. Uh, um, I will I will discuss about some options here, uh, the, especially the recording and computing, which is common techniques in data management. Besides that, you are you are able to create your your graph and charts. There are different types of options under SPSS that you can. Even the, in SPSS, there are some uh, what do you call it options that you can create your own extension or macro. So let me to show you something. In the normal regression analysis, you cannot see this option. This is a process. These are uh, these options created by the uh, Andrew Hayes in terms of mediation and moderation analysis. So he created this macro, and then easily you can install it in your SPSS. If you have a specific uh, protocol or what you call it, uh, techniques for your data analysis is you can create your dialog builder for extension. So it means you can create extension. Of course, it is uh, the professional level, uh, but the point is that you are able. Uh, what you call it, it's more than analysis. You can you can you can a lot you can access to a lot of options under this software. 
Okay, back to our topics, which is frequency table, right? This is simple descriptive statistic. It's very simple. You go to analyze and under descriptive, you can see the frequency. The frequency usually we apply for categorical data. For example, for the gender, marriage, and age, I can create. And also I can, uh, at the same time, we can draw the charts, bar or pie or histogram charts. And uh, it's, it's very simple software to use. So now, as you can see here, these are the frequency tables. Frequency means the, what do you call it, the number of observation under each category of my data. For example, this is gender one and two, the number of subjects and the percentage and valid percentage. Uh, can someone tell me what is the difference between percentage and valid percentage? They are same. Any idea? No. Okay. Let me to tell you something. Sometimes you have some missing data. If I do again descriptive statistic for variables, then you can see the differences can be appear here. The the the, the first percentage, the percent, the first column, include also the missing data. But the valid percent is only a percentage among valid cases. So that's why if your data are completed, so that's why the valid percent and percent are same. But when you have a missing data, when you have a missing data, you can see the difference between percent and valid percent. Why? Because the valid percent only uh, can count the, the valid cases, not the missing data. Clear? So if I want to do the frequency analysis is for look at here, the frequency analysis is usually we do it for categorical data. Suppose that if I want to do the frequency analysis is for a continuous data. Then the table will be too long, correct? And it's difficult to interpret these results, even the charts. So what is the alternative? If you want to present the frequency table for a continuous or interval variable, what we need to do, it's better to categorize it, right? Let me to open another file, maybe in the other file I have. Look at here, this is the age, right? A2 is the age of respondents. So if I want to calculate the frequency of the age, which is A2, the table will be too long. Who is going to explain this table? No worth, right? What shall I do? We can categorize this data, right? How we can categorize it? Suppose that I want to categorize my age but below 20 and above 20. What I need to do? I can create a variable. If it's more than 20, I can, I, sorry, if, I, if it's more than 20, I can put two. If it's less, of, suppose that concentrate on 30. If it's less than 30, one. If it's more than 30, two. So this is less, this is less, this is less, right? And shall I do it manually for all the data? No. As I mentioned, SPSS provide for you some options in data management. Under transform, you can see here, record. Record into different variables. I don't want to record on the same variables because if I do the recording on into the same variables, I will lose my original data. So that's why uh, I always advise if you want to do the recording, please uh, keep the original data and record. Use the record into different variable. Suppose that if I want to record the A2 into another variable, I just put the name A2.cat. I can convert A2 to another variable and all the new values. Under all the new values you define, for example, the less than 30 is 29.999. I just consider low. 
and above of 29.99, just consider it two, means 30 and above. If I click OK, then at the end of my data, I have the A2 cat, right? And then, of course, I can go to the variable view because SPSS provides for you two environment, data view for entering the data and variable view to identify the types of variables, if you have any labels, even for the value, we can, we can create uh, the labels, correct? So if I click, click here under value, one less than 30, and two is more than 30 years. Add, OK. So if I go back to my data, you can see here, and instead of the codes, I can see the, the, the labels. If I click on this icon, the original data will be appear, the original form of data. So if you click on this, you can see the labels. So easily I can calculate the frequency for A2 CAT. So I go to analyze descriptive, and then instead of the A2, I use the A2 CAT. That's all. So now 38.9% are subjects or respondents are below 30 years and 60.1% are above 30 years, right? This is an easy way to convert and transform some of your variables. Sometimes, if you want to compute a new variables, also let me to tell you about this. So suppose that you want to create another variables. Suppose that you want to, uh, this is B1 and B2. Suppose that you want to com combine these two together. So I just, uh, total B. Remember, when you put a name for variables, don't use a space. Don't use a space. Because if I use space, and suppose that pre-1 plus pre-B2, so this is total B pre, pre-B. If I use a space, the system will not accept it. These are some technical points that I want to highlight because small point, but sometimes it's stuck. So now if I click here, it's still it's problem. Why? Because I have a space at the end. I have to remove that space and then click OK. Now I have this total pre. So means you can calculate easily by these options. This numeric expression, of course, we have some other options here. For example, if you want to calculate the mean, maximum, median, mean, a standard deviation of some of the variables together, you can use these function groups. So if you want to do the scoring, uh, there are a lot of options for the time duration. If you want to, it's at, at, this is at advanced level, I don't want to uh, explain it, but remember, uh, there are some functions that can be used uh, if uh, you, you are planning to, for example, for mathematical, you want to calculate the log, sorry, correct? Sometimes you want to convert a variable to the log. Suppose that I want to compare this pre p to the log. So I just put the log dot pre p. Then I use under arithmetics the log 10 and then put it in the numeric expression box and then select this variable and send it there. So if I click OK, at the end of my data, I have the log, right? So sometimes we need to calculate and compute some new variables or index, and that option will help you to do it manually. Uh, sorry, to do it automatically rather than manually in Excel. I saw some of the students, they do all calculation in other softwares like Excel, and then come, they input this data here. You don't need it. We just use the SPSS for data management practices. Is it clear? Yes. Any question? Uh, doctor, what about uh, recording uh, yes or no data? Can we use the automatic uh, recording? Uh, actually, if you want to convert to yes, no, suppose that uh, 
groups? Yeah. Uh, it, it depends on the data. For example, uh, if you want to convert, uh, there is no any categorical data. Let me to show you something else, another data set. So this data, for example, is based on the Likert scale, one to five, right? So if you want to convert it, for example, maybe you sometimes you need to reverse the items. So in the questionnaire, sometimes we have the reverse items, right? So it means the five is the worst answer and one is the best answer. But when you enter the data, this item should be reversed. So if you want to do the reverse, you go to the same variable, record into the same variable. And if you want to convert any data, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, to yes or actually yes or no, always it is categorical data. What do you mean by con recording to yes or no? I mean uh, reco recording yes or no to number. OK, so yeah, let me to tell you something. Yep. Uh, usually let me to clear. OK, suppose that you have a variable here clear insert a variable suppose that you you enter this is numbers i have to convert it to the string first suppose that you originally especially for those people who used the online uh, survey when they want to import data the 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 that those platforms they provide the text to you so then you need to convert it to the numbers suppose that you have yes and then some of data are no this data cannot be analyzed for in many softwares right so in this case when you want to convert it to the numbers um, there is very simple way actually we always sort it and then create another column and then put one here and just copy this one and then for the yes i just put one and then for the next one, I just put zero and then copy paste because it's very simple. We sort it and then we just replace the numbers, right? We sort it first and then we replace. It, even, even without that, you can use the transform record into different variables. Suppose that this variable one, I just want to change it to where one, one. So change it under old and new. You say yes, make it one, no, make it zero. So continue and then OK. At the end of your data, you have this yes, no. Clear? Yes, thank you, doctor. You're welcome. OK, so uh, OK, back to descriptive statistic. Uh, remember, don't expect too much from today's workshop, correct? But I hope that following by this workshop, you can continue to learn a statistic because nowadays a statistic and uh, ability to deal with data is a kind of, uh, what do you call it, one of the competencies that uh, it's highly demanded in the market in different disciplines. Uh, uh, you know, what we have experienced during this pandemic uh, actually, uh, a lot of uh, what you call it uh, success and progress uh, in terms of, for example, vaccine production, it, it was based on uh, what you call it, some techniques in data analysis uh, using some advance, of course. But as long as you understand the context of data, you can apply it in your fields. So remember, no matter what is your uh, what you call it main area you are from education you are from engineering you are from science or medicine beside your main expertise you can be also a data scientist of course you will be you if you know about the techniques in data science and because the core of data science is a statistic data science is not a different things data science which is now <laughs> Uh, called a uh, very what you call it luxury and high demanded uh, what you call it expertise and proficiency in the market uh, uh, for among the if you just google uh, job vacancies 
always the data science at the top. So no matter what is your proficiency, what is your main field, you have to start from now. For your information, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a biotechnologist, right? But of course, my background was a bit close to statistics because I did my master in quantitative genetics, which was mixed between statistics and genetics. But what happened, I, uh, I, I, since I was interested in statistics, I concentrate more on uh, what they call it data and uh, data analysis. But it does not mean that I don't have expertise about my main field, which is biotechnology, right? So you can you can be a statistician. At the same time, you can be a physician. You can be a mathematician. You can be a a person who who is from education or uh, linguistic, uh, medical science. So you need to start from now, and don't expect too much from this two days workshop. <laughs> okay. So, but it can be a good a starting point. So it means if you start from now continuously. I mean, uh, let's to share with you something. If you go to uh, how to start, how to start website. If you go to how to start website, this uh, always I introduce. Always I introduce this uh, channel, YouTube channel to my students. There are, if I'm not mistaken, maybe thousand video, the short video, 10 minutes, five minutes, five minutes, three minutes, right? Try to keep learning. Learning is a process that cannot be stopped. For your information, after 25 years dealing with data, to be honest, I can't go to sleep every night if I don't try to learn something new. Correct? So learning a statistic is a continuous process. Why? Because always there are some new techniques, new softwares, new methods, and you can keep working hard and update yourself. Clear? Yes, that's Dr. Yeah. So that's why within these two days, of course, of course, I will do my best to teach you some, what you call it, some basic statistic and the common statistical test that uh, probably you, you need to apply and use in your research, and uh, your studies, but it is a continuous process and don't stop, please. Okay, back to a slide. So now we move to the central tendency. The central tendency are some, uh, what do you call it, the statistical indicators or parameters that show the core as center of your sample. There are three type of central tendency measure. The mode, which is the most frequently observation, among your data. The median is the middle point of your distribution. So it means if you sort your data ascending or descending, the midpoint of your, uh, what do you call it, score is called median. And the last one is the mean. Mean is the is, is average. I mean, sum of the score divided by the number of scores. It's a well-known, uh, what do you call it, uh, indicators to show and reflect the, the center or the load of your sample, right? So the mode actually is appropriate central tendency for nominal data. So means this, uh, the mode we use it for the nominal data. Mean, usually we use it for ordinal data or a quantitative data which is not normally distributed. We talk about normal distribution later. And median, usually we use for, for a quantitative data which is normal. Uh, in SPSS, easily you can calculate the mean and standard deviation. If I go to analyze descriptive statistic frequency, as you can see here under the statistic, all the central tendency are, are available here. Mean, median, mode. The summation also, they call it as a central tendency because it's same as mean, just divided by the numbers. So now I'm able to calculate all this outcome. Look at here for this pre-A, the mean is 21.13, median is 21, and mode are 21. So 
I will explain later that when a variable is normally distributed, mean, median, and mode all are same. And for this case, the pre-A is uh, normally distributed. I will talk about normal distribution later. So the point is that when we have three samples, assume that I have three samples like this. I have a sample, sample one, This is sample one and sample two, sample three. And sample three. Can you tell me how much is the average of this uh, sample? The sample one, the average is how much? Five. Five. Sample two, five. Sample three, five. So despite they have similar average, can I say that these three samples are same since they have similar mean score? Of course, no. Why? Something different. What is the difference? What is the difference among these three samples? The population. The distribution. The variation, right, diversity. So in the first sample, no variation. All are similar. The second samples, the, the, we have variation, but not the same as sample three. That's why when we want to explain our sample, using only central tendency is not enough. We also need to assist dispersion index or indices. There are three main dispersion index. One is range, very simple, maximum, minus, minimum. And the second one that I want to uh, highlight is the standard deviation. So look at the, this data. Suppose that if I want to calculate the range, how much is the range here? Zero. How much is the range here? Eight. Right? And the last sample? How much is the range? Minimum, maximum? Eight. So again, two range are similar. Can I say that sample two and three are same? No. Why? Because the range only included only two numbers, minimum and maximum, which are same, and ignore the rest of data in the, in the, in the, in the distribution, right? So that's why when you are dealing with the quantitative data, for categorical data, yes, the, uh, the range for ordinal data, it's OK. But when we are talking about continuous data, we need to also calculate another measure of dispersion that cover all data. So when we want to calculate the dispersion for a data, let me to remove this one. Suppose that I have this data. And I want to calculate the standard deviation. What is the standard deviation? Deviation from where? Deviation from the mean. In a statistic, when we want to calculate the deviation of our sample, we need a reference point. What is that? And the reference point always is mean, right? So what is the mean here? Five. So what I'm going to do here, I just want to calculate the x i minus x bar. What is the x bar? Average. Is, thank you very much. So remember, let me to explain something for you. So we have x bar and we have mu. Both of them we say average, right? or mean. So what is the difference between X bar and mu? One is sample, another one is population. Yes, X bar, we use it for sample. Mu is for population. So please do not report your mean 
in your sample and don't present it with the Mu. Mu is for population. We expect always when we do a sampling, we only calculate the mean and we expect that the mean is a good estimation from the population. That's why we say that the mathematical expectation of the average of sample is equal to Mu. So means we hope, we expect that the mean of our sample is equal to the population. So this is called mathematical expectation equation. OK, back to this data. So now we want to calculate the standard deviation. Deviation from where? Deviation from mean. So can you tell me how much is the deviation here? It's equal to this cells minus 5, right? If I drag it, it will be calculated for all of the subjects. So then I need to calculate the total deviation. The total deviation means summation of deviation of each subject from the mean. So means 4 minus 4 plus 4 plus minus 3 plus 3. This value always will be equal to 0. Why? Because some of the numbers are above mean, some of them are below, right? So that's why the total deviation from the mean always is zero. So that's why we cannot calculate the total deviation. What shall I do? What is your alternative? So there are two ways, correct? To remove the sign because some of them are positive, some of them are negative. One way is to calculate the absolute value of xi minus x bar, absolute value. So if I want to calculate the absolute value, it will be four. Let me to use the Excel. If I want to calculate the absolute value means ABS. ABS in Excel will calculate the absolute value. So if I drag it, it will be calculated for all. And now I can calculate the summation. How? If you go to the home, can you see here? This, upset, this option is the summation. So the summation of these cells is how much? This is the total deviation, total absolute deviation. So then how much is the average deviation? AVD, absolute deviation, sorry, AD. This is the average of deviation. So it's equal to 14 divided by, how many cases do I have here? Five, right? So then divided by this equal divided by five. We don't look at the total deviation because total deviation depends on the number of subjects. Of course, if you have more observation, the total deviation probably will be higher. So this is one way that we can calculate and a dispersion index considering all the data. As you can see here, one way is to calculate the average deviation by using this formula. But this, this index is not a common uh, and well-known uh, measure in a statistical analysis. In a statistical analysis, we use another criteria, which is called a standard deviation. If you remember to remove the to, to remove the sign, what we did, we first we absolute it. What is the other alternative way? We can square it, right? We can just calculate the x y x i minus x bar square, right? Agree? Yes, doctor. Okay. So means I can square this number, power two. So this is the sign of the power. So means I can square it, right? And then I can calculate the summation of a square of deviation from the mean. 
This is called sum of square. Sum of a square or SS. So then I need to calculate the total, this total. So then easily I just go here, click on summation. So this is the total SS. This is SS. So then we need to calculate the MS, average of deviation, average of deviation. So means this number divided by five. So means the average of deviation mean a score is how much? 10, right? But the problem is here. So if I divide this number, if I divide this number by N, it will give me the MS. You know what is the other name for the MS? Variance. And since the variance is the square value, why? Because it will square all the differences, right? So if I calculate the square root of the variance, SQRT. So SQRT in Excel will calculate the square root. So how much is the square root? 3.1. Do you know what is the name? A standard deviation. A standard deviation is a square root of, so variance. Why? Because we, since, for example, the unit of my data is kg, kilogram. So the unit of this number will be kilogram square. So if I want to measure the variance, the, the unit of the variance, this, the unit also for the variance will be kg square, right? So when I when I square root the mean square or variance, I can convert the unit again to the kg, same as original data. In in quantitative uh, data analysis for continuous data, we always use mean for the central tendency and a standard deviation for cent for dispersion uh, index or measuring the variation. Is it clear now? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is the problem for online classes always less of eye contact and interaction with the with the participants okay hopefully the pandemic ends and then soon and then we can run our face-to-face -face classes okay no question the doctor some sometimes we we divided by n minus one okay that's good questions thank you very much usually yes you're right when we calculate for the population we we divide it by n when we talk about the sample we divide it by n minus 1 this is called degree of freedom so this is just correction of the sample right so if you have if you are dealing with a sample then in the variance formula here we have to divide it by n minus one you are you're right clear yes okay so now this is descriptive statistic actually uh, it's very simple you can you can explain you can you can what you call it explore more by yourself later uh, if you are interested to statistic. Okay, before <clears throat> moving to the inferential statistic, let's talk about let's talk about
hypothesis. What is this? What is the hypothesis? Theory of outcome. Theory of outcome? Mm. Um, causal relationships that you've drawn from, uh, from the literature? Causal relationship that we've drawn from the literature mm, can, but not exactly. Claims uh, that we want to prove? Claims that we want to prove, okay, much more close, okay, anything else? Assumptions, assumptions, yes, 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 good. Propositions. Yeah. Tentative gaze. Correct, close, yeah, yeah. Academically, scientifically, the hypothesis is, is an assumption, right? The hypothesis is, is an assumption. Sorry. The hypothesis is an assumption about certain characteristics of a population in a statistic. This is a bit not clear definition. This is my definition. I found this definition from a book in grade four in primary school. <laughs> it's very simple, you know, I, I remember the those that I wanted to teach for the first time research methodology long time ago. I was looking for definition of the hypothesis and surprisingly and accidentally I found this definition, this definition here. A probable answer to a question in, a, in my son book. <laughs> A probable answer to a question is called a, a hypothesis, but I did a bit, uh, what do you call it, modified. I modified the definition and uh, I add these two parts. A question that which form in researcher mind. So remember, when we do a research, always we, we start with what? The question. OK, what are the source of the questions? So when you do a research, always you start with the questions. How you come with the questions? Problem. How you define the problem? How you come with the problem? Okay. Problem and questions are same, right? How you come with this? Observation. Or observation. Or yeah, observation is one source of your uh, what do you call it? It's a source of your questions. You you are dealing with the the problem in the community, in the hospital, in the industry, and then you observe that there is some problem, and then you try to solve the problem. So another source of questions is literature review, right? You can find the gap based on the literature review. So there are two sources for the research questions mainly: observation and literature review. So, I believe that the, the strength of any research depends on the quality of the research questions. If you spend more time on defining and supporting your questions, your research outcomes will be different from the others. So, means the value of your findings depends on the quality of designing and defining the research questions. I have seen a lot of people, they just repeat the same questions. No value at the end. It's already proven. What do you want to prove again? So for your information, always I, uh, what do you call it, mention about this uh, story. Uh, a friend of mine has another friend <laughs> and he mentioned that one of the Iranian professor in my country actually is a professor of social science. He's a well-known professor in social science and he has uh, what he call it, taught in different countries, United States, Canada, Germany. Uh, during one time, he said that that professor, he bought a taxi. You know why? To drive or to sell? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know why? 
because to, to the income was not enough and he tried to <laughs> no actually the story is not that the story is that long time ago when there was no social media the social phenomena the social problems always uh, were difficult to be assessed right and you know i i think most of you maybe you have the same experience the taxi drivers especially in the middle east countries they always drive around the city in different area and always they are free to talk with the passengers right so one way to collect information and observe the problem in the whole city to be to be in touch with the with the normal and ordinary people and he bought the, this taxi and he play role as a taxi driver sometimes to be to to to, to be able to understand the real problem in the community he, he negotiated with people as a passengers and actually he collected data during that time <laughs> and that's why always his research questions was totally different and unique research questions very good idea <clears throat> yeah of course it is a great idea so the point is that you cannot do a research sitting in your office and only based on the literature no you need to go to the industry one of my student actually long time ago he wanted to do he wanted to do a study on waste management practices in industries we you cannot just stick to the government or private sector or reports in the internet you need to go to the industry you you need to observe how they do this kind of practices what are the barriers you need to talk with them to formulate your research hypothesis you need first to understand the problem is it is it clear for you Rem sorry this is not related to statistic but i can't avoid this point during my workshops always in my all teachings in methodology and statistic i mention about this story to highlight because you are going to use a statistic for what to analyze the data but when there is no worth it's a kind of wasting time so that's why always i start with this story so back to the hypothesis the hypothesis is a probable answer to a research questions correct which is formed in researcher mind based on observation or literature review suppose that i talked with some of staff in the upm staff this workshop initially was started in upm that's why i still keep this upm slides <laughs> okay so i uh, you know i i talked with some of the staff and they i found that some of them are not satisfied and when i talk about them i think the main problem was the salary and then i came with these questions is there is there any relationship a uh, positive relationship between salary and job satisfaction correct these questions came through the observation so when you formulate your research questions then you can convert it to the your probable answer what is my probable answer to this question a positive relationship between salary and job satisfaction it is your hypothesis so each questions can should be tally with the hypothesis so means when you design your research questions maybe you break down these research questions to some hypothesis hypothesis number 2 number 3 separating so but it rationally should be linked logically with the questions clear yes doctor so there are several types of research question and hypothesis of of course i want to just skip that part basically uh in 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 most of a research according to my experience i can divide the hypothesis to hypothesis that concentrating on comparison and comparison the sorry hypothesis group 2 most focus on relationship and effect cause and effect studies right so actually most of the research hypotheses can be classified i'm not saying all because we have some other kind of hypotheses 
I don't want to talk about it because it it can be discussed at the advanced level, at the basic and intermediate level. Basically, most of the hypotheses can be divided in two categories: comparison and relationship. So that's why later you can see today we talk about comparison statistical tests and also some relationship statistical tests. Correct? Okay. Before moving to uh, introducing some statistical tests to you, I need to highlight that, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of statistical tests, parametric and non-parametric tests. So if your research variables outcomes is qualitative data without any doubt, delay, just use the non-parametric test. You cannot use parametric tests. But if your data outcome is quantitative, you can use parametric test if the variable is normally distributed. And now I'm going to talk about normality test. So first you have to check whether data are normally distributed or not. If yes, then you can use the parametric test. And remember, the parametric tests are more stronger compared to the non-parametric test. Why? Because non-parametric test, we call it free distribution test. But the parametric tests are based on normal distribution. So that's why we know the pattern. So that's why all the calculation in parametric tests is much more accurate in terms of especially calculating the p-value compared to the non-parametric test. That's why always our priority is to use the parametric test. So sometimes when you test data for normality and it is not normal, then you need to find why. Why the data are not normal? Is it because of the outliers? If there is any unusual numbers? or sometimes no, the data has no any outliers, then we can convert our data. So data transformation. So you can convert your data. There are four types of transformation in the statistic. The common techniques for data transformation. You can convert your X to the log X. You can convert your data to a square root of X. You can reverse it. Or you can calculate the X to the arc sinus. So usually when data are proportion or percentage, we use this come, uh, trend that. There are different types of data transformation. I'm not going to talk about it. But at least you need to know there are many different techniques. But basically, these are the main techniques of data transformation. Under log, we have some different types, right? So for X as well, the reverse. There are some other new techniques for data transformation, which is not under the topic of the, the scope of my talk course today. But you can Google it and you can find it. So if you just Google data transformation always dr google knows better than everyone right <laughs> you don't need teacher data transformation techniques if i just methods yeah uh, you can find data transformation techniques, if I'm not mistaken, in a statistic. I think we have to check a statistic. A, stat a statistic, yeah. So we have log transform, square, correct, but the, he, this, this reference only mentioned two topics. And then we have arc sinus, arc sinus transformation in a statistic is another types of transformation. And as I mentioned, reverse also. Reverse also is uh, uh, what you call it, types of transformation. 
uh, even you come we can combine some of this transformation together that's why all all these efforts all we kill ourselves for what to make our data normal to be able to use the parametric test if data parametric after transformation then you can use the parametric test if not then final choice is that even data quantitative but not normally distributed then you can use the non parametric test of course there are another condition that we can use the non parametric test if data are quantitative it's related to the sample size that i will discuss later not now is it clear now but what yes. is the what is the normal distribution what is the normal distribution the normal distribution is a frequency distribution of a data if this distribution the shape of this distribution is look like a bell shape we call it data the, the, we call it normal distribution right there are some characteristics for the normal distribution first it is the bell shape and it is it is a symmetrical what you call it shape and the center of this distribution is the mean but mean and median and mode also they are same half of the area under curve is above the peak is above the mean and half of them below the mean so means in a normal curve the mean is the center of symmetry 50% 50% similar but the mean is equal to median and equal to mode why why mode because it has highest frequency why median because divide data by two equal right so in a normal distribution we have uh, this condition look if i just want to draw the uh, for example, the histogram or normal frequency distribution of the pre-A, if I go to analyze, you remember on the frequency, I am able to draw the histogram with the normal curve in SPSS. Now you can see here, this is the normal curve. Is it normally distributed? Very close, right? Very, very, but we have, a, uh, uh, we have a bit deviation from the normal curve in some parts, right? As it can be seen here, we have in some parts, we have a bit deviation from the normal curve. Is it important or not? We don't know. Is it normal or not? We don't know. We have to test it. To test the normality distribution, the normal distribution, there are two, uh, what you call it, statistic that can be calculated. One is skewness, the other is courtesies. Skewness is the degree of departure from symmetry of distribution. As you can see here, this figure, the normal curve should be here, but the peak deviated from the symmetry to the left and here the peak tends to the right side so when it's left side we call it positively skewed because the tail is in positive area and when it the peak in the right side we call it negative skewed another measure and deviation from the normal shape is a degree of peakness. If you look at the, this graph, the normal curve has a very smooth peak, not too sharp and not too flat. So if it's too sharp, we call it leptocortic. When it's, pla it's flat, less peak, so we call it platycortic. This is mesocortic or normal, correct? So if the cortex is, is positive, means it is very sharp, leptocortic. 
When it's negative, means platycortex. So, but the point is that when we calculate the skewness and cortices, what is the acceptable level? What is the acceptable level for skewness and cortices? So, there are three way techniques to compare, to test the normality of your data. So, I'm going to introduce you these ways. The first one is based on the absolute value of skewness and cortices. Maybe you ask yourself, how can I calculate it? Simple. When you, dist when you uh, do the frequency analysis, right? As it can be seen under a statistic. Can you see here? We have skewness and cortices. Continue, okay. So now, look at here. This is the skewness and cortices for my data. But of course, there is a skewness and there is a cortices. Is it acceptable or not? We don't know. Let's to talk about the acceptable level. Okay, do you need another five minutes break? No. Okay, so let me know if you are, if you feel that you need a break, just let me know. <laughs> okay, so let me to have a look at the chat box. Oh, there are some questions. Okay, leave your questions for the end of the day. Uh, I will answer to your questions. Okay, back to... So the first way to check the normality of data is look at the value of skewness and cortices. Some references mention that minus one to plus one is acceptable. So if your skewness, especially skewness is much more important than cortices. If skewness is between these two range, so means data is normal. But there are some other reference even mentioned minus two plus two. For cortices, we have some reference even they mention minus seven to plus seven acceptable. But to me, actually, minus three to plus three is for the cortices acceptable. This is a very simple rule of thumbs. The other way to check the normality, which is very good, and I advise you to use it always, is the ratio of skewness to its own standard error. If the standard error is between minus 1.96, to plus 1.96, then it is normally distributed. Same for courtesies. A statistician advised that this range if your sample size is too large, this range can be, if your sample size is above 200 or 300, if N is more than 200 or 300, so this range can be between minus 3.29 to minus, minus 3.29 to plus 3.9, right? So this is the second techniques of testing the normality. The next technique is <clears throat> testing. There are many statistical tests that check the deviation of your distribution from a normal distribution. Kolmogorov, Smirnov, Shapiro, Week, Anderson, Darling. There are many other techniques that can be. These are the common techniques in a SPSS. So means you can do a statistical test. If your statistical test is significant, it means less than 0 
means your data is not normal. So, in SPSS, it is provided to do this statistical test. But remember, this only applicable for a small sample size. If you have a large sample size, I do not advise you to use the Kolmogorov Smirno for Shapiro week. So remember, if you want to do a statistical test, normality test, in SPSS, you can go to the Explore. When you go to the Explore, for example, for pre-A, under plot, we have normality plot with test. So we have the plot and we have the test. Let's click on OK. So now, as you can see here, we have this table. Let me to copy this table in Excel form. Then I easily can. So what is this? The mean. I, I don't talk about this now, later. What is this 5% trim mean? Does anybody know what does it mean? 5% trim mean? Anybody knows about that? Hundred three peoples are here, and no one knows about the. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so I when we have to do with um, with eliminating five percent of the data, like two yes. point. Correct. Right. Yes, correct. Remember, uh, one of the reason that data, uh, what do you call it, uh, are not normally distributed is because of the outliers, right? When. Uh, When you sort your data from the minimum to maximum, correct? This is your whole data. When you sort it, of course, the outliers will be located at the end of the series, right? If you remove 2.5% from here and 2.5% from here, if there is a huge number, huge value, correct, it will be removed. So that's why, as it can be seen here, the mean all data is 21.13. But when you remove the 5%, still the mean is very close. This indicates that there is no critical outlier. So this is one way to understand whether there is an outliers or not. So, if you remember, I mentioned that the in normal distribution, the mean and median are same. Look at here. The mean and median are very similar together. No difference. So means definitely this data is normal, this data. But basically we consider the skewness as and courtesies refer to our preview preview previous uh, explanation are they acceptable or not yes okay yes because it is this data for skewness and courtesies it is within acceptable range, minus one to plus one. So according to the first rule of thumbs, and if even if I want to calculate the ratio, okay, the ratio, this column is a standard error, and this is the, so if I, if I divide this number by the standard error, and if I divide this number by its own standard error, are these two value acceptable? Do you remember 1 minus 0 0.96 plus 9.6? This is for a small sample, for, for the, what do you call it, for the uh, a small and medium sample size. For the more than 200, even minus 3.29 and plus 3.9 is acceptable. So according to this two cutoff point, this ratio are acceptable or not? 
still acceptable. So means, yeah, that's good. So means it can be concluded that our data normally distributed, right? Yes. Yes. Good. So the next techniques, as I mentioned, is a statistical test called Mogorov Smirnov. Look at the SPSS output. In a SPSS output, after descriptive statistic, we have test of normality. I copy this test and then paste it in again in Excel. I think it's easier to see the tables, right? So now look at here. This is the this is Kolmogorov Smirnov test, and this is the Shapirovic test. So again, I just want to remind you. This test is very sensitive and don't use it when your sample size is more than 50 or 100. Definitely above 100, it is not advice to, to use this data. It's very sensitive. Any small deviation will be significant. So according to these results, the pre-A, is it normal or not? If you remember, as long as the p-value is more than 0 0.05, I can say my data is normal. So means it is not significant. Why? Because it is not less than 0 0.05. Both tests, Shapiro Week and Kolmogorov Smirnov test, both of them are not statistically significant, right? So that's why it can be concluded that data are normally distributed, right? Accept? Yes. Thank you. So then, if I use it for another data set, suppose that I have this EFA data set. No, not this one. Let me to find another data set. Yeah. I think this data set. So suppose that if I just click on pre-BA and do the explore for the this pre-BA plot, normality plot with test, if I run it now, So look at here. It is significant. Look at the value. I just want to show you this the two table in Excel. So look at here. How much is the ratio? The ratio acceptable, right? Even the value are very small. But look at the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. Is it significant or not? Both of them significant. So means data is not normal. And this is because of this sample size. My sample size is very large. So despite this value are acceptable, but the test of the normality test, look at here, even if I look at the, do you think these numbers, 3.37 and 3.4, is it? Is there any difference? Not too much. And the median also is very close to the mean. So there is no outliers, actually, critical outliers. And data can be, can be assumed uh, as a normal distributed variables. But the problem is that the Kolmogorov Smirnov test is very sensitive. So that's why it is not advised to use the Kolmogorov Smirnov test for the, let me to show you something. When you have large sample size, do not use this, correct? So one more thing, again, I want to use this opportunity to share. Always I <laughs> advise uh, and show these things to my students and uh, part clients that please, if you have any questions, don't worry, don't stress yourself, just drop your questions in the in the research gate. I don't know whether you have, you are a research gate uh, what you call it, member or not? If not, please join to the research gates. It is an academic networks that can be what you call it, 
uh, a very useful platform uh, to communicate with others, to create your networks. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, of course, you will get the RG score, for example. I'm a bit lazy <laughs> because of I'm too busy, right? So, but you can get the RG score, you can introduce yourself, your skill set, you can publish your papers, for example, how many papers you have, your citation, the what do you call it, the number of articles, number of projects, number of answers that you share. You, you can share your article. And one more thing that is here is questions. If you have any question, you can drop your questions here. For example, sometimes someone asks here, which is related to my fields, how to analyze results from two replicated experiments. OK, maybe if I have time, I will go and answer to this person. But already three people answer to these questions. Don't don't uh, shy and uh, to drop your questions here. This is one way that you can communicate with other experts, right? Suppose that if you want to come and see me in RMC, you have to pay 200 ringgit per hour for consultation, right? But drop these questions, maybe you can find your answer, then you, you can save your money, <laughs> okay? So create your networks, and two networks that I always advise students and researchers to create, one is uh, research gates, the other is, uh, what do you call it, the LinkedIn. I don't know whether you have uh, LinkedIn or not. This is another LinkedIn uh, platform that you can, what do you call it, communicate and create your networks, upload your information here, what is, uh, what do you call it, your activity. For some of people to be informed, if, you are, if they want to apply a job, then easily the, uh, they can be assessed through the activity that they have in the, your experience, your education, you know, a skill set. Some people maybe recommend you, you know, and your publications, your projects. So pre, please remember, as a professional person, uh, an academic person, uh, you also need to be active in academic networking. Okay, sorry, uh, back to the slides. So now, uh, this is the question that someone asked regarding to the the, the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, correct? For normality test. Uh, and always the research gates. If you have any questions, the research gates will be at the top. People's the, the answer to this research question. Again, remind you, if your sample size is more than 30 or 40, do not use Kolmogorov Smirnov. It's very sensitive. Okay, so this is about the normality test. Any question? No questions? Okay, just give me a second to turn off the aircon. I will be back, it's too cold here. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's continue. So now we move to the statistical test. Okay, now introduction finished, the basic uh, issue related to the statistical test finished. Now we move to the statistical test. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I divided the statistical test according to the two types of Hypothesis, the hypothesis is for comparison and the hypothesis is for the uh, relationship. I hope that I can finish the first part of the analysis by today, the whole uh, these tech, the methods, and we move to the next one by tomorrow. Uh, we talk about relationship and regression analysis and also factor analysis. These are the topics that I decided to uh, teach you for this two days workshop. Okay, so back to these slides. Uh, 
So as I mentioned, these are these are a statistical tests that can be applied for comparative tests of the hypothesis at the bivariate or univariate level. So to identify the test, what you need to define, you need to answer to two questions. First question, what is, how many samples do you have? How many samples do you have? And what is the type of your variable? If it's quantitative and normally distributed, you have to use this test. All these tests are parametric tests. So this is parametric test. And if data are quant not, quant not normally distributed, or if your outcome is a qualitative test, test the, sorry, qualitative variable, then you can use this test. All these tests are non-parametric tests. Correct? So now back to the first part. You need to answer to these two questions. First, one sample. Two samples and more than two samples. Let's say that one group, two groups, and more than two groups. Because when we want to compare, we are trying to compare groups, right? Can, you, can someone tell me, what does it mean, one sample? Can we compare one group or one sample to what? Any idea? Um, um, excuse me, Doctor. We can compare uh, with the um, population, right? Population. population. Or sometimes, population. yeah. Or sometimes we can compare our group mean with what? With a standard, with a norm, right? Yes. So, so you, for example, let me to show you something. Okay, can you see, can you see this? Yes. What is this? Rainbow. Yeah, it juice. is juice, right? Soybean drink, right? So suppose that you are from Syrian and you want to do the quality control of these products. In this product, they mentioned that the protein is 4.8 gram, right? The company, the, the company uh, claimed that it contains of, sorry, 1.9 grams of protein. How can I check this company is right? How can I check the quality of this product? What is your solution? Sample their product. We I think we have a standard, uh, you know, um, uh, sample that we compare the with them. So first of all, we need to collect the sample, right? I cannot open all the productions in, from the factory to check one by one. So what we do, we do a random sampling from the production line, right? We collect a sample. For example, you collect uh, from this product. I don't know whether you can see here. Yeah, you can you can collect hundred samples from these products and you bring it to the lab and you analyze it right so this company mentioned that the average should be 1.9 right it should not be less it should not be high sometimes maybe less is dangerous high is also wasting money for that company let's to do this job Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So our, yes. our we, we send our officer to this company and ask him to collect, a, what do you call it, to collect a random sample from the production line and bring the samples to the lab. So he selected 20 samples from the factory randomly blinded and then 
without informing them. We just go and collect some data from the store, from the line, a random sample, a totally random sample. And then, of course, it is costly. If you want to analyze these samples in the lab, each one maybe takes, for example, 100, 200 ringgit to analyze the, the, all the characteristics and then the, what do you call it, the uh, parameters. So for this protein, we collect data and then we found that this is, this is the data, uh, 1.5, 1.76, 1.85, 1.7, 1.6. 1.9, 1.7, 1.6, 1 1.4, 1 1.6. Okay, suppose that I have only 10, just assume that I have collected, I have collected 20 samples, right? Okay, the measure that I have here is quantitative or qualitative? Quantitative. Quantitative. And my research question is that whether the mean of my sample is equal to 1.9 or not, because the company claimed that on the production that it should contain 1.9 millig sorry gram protein. Correct. So then, my research question whether it is equal to 9 point gram or not. So. I want to convert this research question to the hypothesis. What shall I do? So my hypothesis is that, okay, the factory is right. The average of the production is equal to 1.9. Alternative hypothesis is that the average is not equal to 1.9. Agree? Or not? Correct? So now we want to do the test. How many samples do I have? Only one sample. I have only one sample. My data is quantitative, yes. Is it normally distributed? We don't know. We have to check the normal distribution. What shall I do? I go to data. I go to analyze, descriptive, explore. I check the normality of this. Let's to put a name here. I just put the protein, PR. So I go to analyze, descriptive, explore, and then I just put the PR plots, normality plot with test. That's all. My sample is a small. That's why we check the Kolmogorov spin of this. Oh, it's not significant. That's good. It's normally distributed. Oh, I forgot to tell you something about other techniques for the normality test, which is based on the visual, uh, what do you call it, uh, procedure. So there are two types of plots that you can check for normality. One is QQ plot. This QQ plot, sorry, I missed that part. I have to back and explain these two charts to you. So this is QQ plot. And this line is normal line, and this reference line for the normal issue, and this is your observation. As long as your observation are close to the line, it means data are normal. The second way to check the normality is box plot. So this is called box plot. Box plot is according to distribution of data, let me to copy here. The box plot is another way to check the normality of data. So the line in the middle is the median. Or second quartile, Q2. The first line here, we call it Q1 first quartile, so means 25% of people, subjects, this area is 25%, this area is covered 25%, and this area is 25%.
So this is called Q3. So if you see these two tails and this box and one line almost in the middle, then you can say that your data is normally distributed, right? So back to this one. Suppose that when I enter this data, I forgot to put 1.30. I just put 130. Why? Because I, the, my keyboard has a problem and then I did not include point dot. That's why when I check the box plot again, look at here. Look at the value of skewness and courtesies. How much is it? This led me to compare it. What will be happen if you don't care? So now look at the values. Only by single mistakes. The not here, sorry. I think. Yeah. Look at here. How much is the value? Four and twenty. And look at the box plot. Look at the QQ plot. Can you see the QQ plot? It is yes. far from the line. And look at the box plot. This is the box plot. When you see this figure, when you see this figure, This number already represented by the, can you see here, a streak? What does it mean? So means there is an outlier. This is critical outliers. So remember, in SPSS, there are two symbols to show the outliers. One of them is a streak or a star. The other is circle. If, if data outliers presented by the circle so means they are outliers, but not critical outliers. We can still keep it. If the data was is shown by asterisk, then means this is critical outlier. We have to remove it from data, or we have to check our data. So when I check my data, oh, I found, I found I, there is a problem. It was 1.30. Mistakenly, I just skip the point and then I enter it wrongly. This is a real example. One of my students from UKM long time ago, she did analysis and the results was not satisfied and she was confused and stressed. Because of what? Because of this problem. Uh, hold on, please. I'm um, sorry, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so in the real study, actually, what happened? He missed the same, uh, what do you call it, dot between the no decimal numbers. And only a few cases, only a few cases, two or three per each variable, destroy the whole results. So the data cleaning is very important. Make sure the data are entered correctly and there is no any critical outliers. Clear? Amirul, I will explain this one tomorrow because we talk about logistic regression tomorrow. Can you hear me? Yes, yes doctor. doctor. Oh, uh, yeah, they sometimes, yes, sometimes, doctor. Yeah, sometimes say something, <laughs> you know, uh, because I had a bad experience. A few days ago, I had the meeting and I keep talking, 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 and then suddenly I found that, that I lost the line and then I had to repeat everything again. So just sometimes say something <laughs> that makes sure that uh, we are connected to each other through the MS team. Okay, so back to these results. As it can be seen here, data is normally distributed. Fine, perfect. The box plot is nice. The QQ plot is K, all the values. So what we need to do? 
we have to do the one sample t-test. How can I do the one sample t-test? Simple. You go to analyze, you go to compare mean and one sample t-test. So you put the protein as a test variable and the test value is 1.9. Do you remember? We want to compare the mean of our sample from 1.9. Do you remember? Yes, Dr. Okay, just click OK. Now, according to these results, according to these results, according to these results, the average of my sample is how much? 1.6. The test value was how much? 1.9. How much is the difference? Minus 0.26. Correct? Yes. So, is it significant or not? This value is your p value. Is it significant? Yes. So look at look at the p value. The p value is not zero actually. If you look at the p value, p value is very small number. Let me to show you the actual value. If I right click here, format cells, numbers with 10 decimal numbers. Actually, this is the p value. Remember, many statistical softwares, when the p value is small, they only show 0, 0, 0. Please don't report this 0, 0, 0. P value never can be 0. So if your p value is like that, when you report it, report it like this. P is less than 0 0.001. You got it? Yes. OK, now, now we want to interpret the results. In this sample, the mean of sample is 1.6, and it is significantly less than 1.9. So what does it mean? What does it mean, significantly less than 1.9? My sample was a random sample. When I'm saying it is significant, what does it mean? Silent. Why? Uh, the product is not up to standard. Of course, it is not up to standard in this sample, but when they say significant, I'm talking, I'm highlighting and emphasizing on significant. When we say significant, what does it mean? Not normally distributed. Again? We check the null. Okay, rejected. What does it mean? When we, when we reject it, what does it mean? What, what is the point? We can generalize it to the entire okay, population. Okay, that's, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. We can generalize it. Remember, the p-value is your sampling bias. So means by high confidence, we can say that if we repeat the sampling with other samples, we can get the same results. So means these things can be repeated in other samples or we can generalize it to the population. So means we have to inform that company that the quality of the protein that you produce is less than claim value. The value that you claim is 1.9, but you are producing, a, what do you call it, the product with less. By how much confidence you can uh, find this company, 99%. Why? Because the p-value is less than 0 0.001. And look at here. What is this? What is this two column? 95% confidence of difference. What does it mean? Oh. 
we are 95% confident that if we take another sample, the number will lie between this range. Thank you very much. Correct. So remember, the mean difference in our sample is minus, minus 0 0.26. But 95% confidence indicate that if this study repeat again and again and again and again and again, out of 100 times, always the difference will be between minus 3.5 to minus 1.8. It never, it never, never becomes zero. So means there is no possibility that the zero located in this range. So means by 95% confidence, we can say that your production at least is 1.0018 unit or gram less than the one that you claim. Then you can find this company. So means you can remove the, this is a kind of quality control. Understand? Clear? Yes. Yes, doctor. Okay, good. So now I want to make another job <laughs> and challenge for you. So this is another issue. Let me to clean my whiteboard. What is this? What is this? Significance means the p-value, mm -hmm. right? But when we say two-tailed, what does it mean? Uh. Five percent outliers. No, I'm talking about the two tail. What does it mean? Two tail. It can be higher or lower than one point nine. No. Positive, negative, is it? Directional hypothesis. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Correct. So remember, in research. We have two types of the hypotheses. The hypothesis can be directional. And non-directional. So when we say directional, for example, for comparison and relationship. When we say comparison, for example, we say that female are more than male. Or male are more than female. Or relationship, we say X positively correlated with Y or Y. Or X is negatively correlated with Y. So we already identified the direction of relationship or the direction of difference. So if your hypothesis is that the female or more than male or group one is more than group two, or the relationship is positive or negative, this is directional hypothesis. But when you say the male are for comparison, for non-directional, we say that male are different from the female. Or you can say that for relationship, we say that X is correlated with Y. That's all, we don't know positive or negative. So this is non-directional and this is directional. So remember, when you use directional hypothesis, all the p-value should be based on what? One thing, one tail. One tail. And it's non-directional, it should be based on two tailed, or this is called one-sided, one-sided, and or two-sided. Right? 
So, but the point is that many statistical software, they only give you the two tails. They do not suppose that even in this study, my hypothesis was directional. But the problem is here. The SPSS only generate two tails, but I need only one tail. What shall I do? So if you want to generate one tail, you need to just divide the two tails by two. Correct? So remember what I'm talking about, one tail, one tail. versus two tail. So when we have one tail, the P for the two tail, we divide the P value in both sides. <clears throat> Sorry. When we have two tailed, the bias divided by two, so means the more uh, the area here is 95% confidence. We put 2.5% here and 2.5% here. Of course, the value of T will be larger. But when you have one tail, When you have one tail, less or high, you put all the 5% in the left side or right. So that's why the T value or Z value will be smaller. So you put all the acceptable, this is, this is acceptable and this is rejection. This is rejected area and this is accepted area. So that's why, remember, it is very critical to understand the concept of one tail and two tail. If your hypothesis is, okay, just give you an example. Suppose that my P value here is 0 0.064. Is it significant or not? Is it significant? No. Yes or no? It no. is not significant. No. It no. is not significant. significant. But remember, the SPSS give me two tails, but my hypothesis was one tail. What shall I do? I have to divide 0 0.064 by 2. So my actual p value will be how much? 0 0.032. Is it significant? Yes. Yes. So now yes. look at here how how the type of hypothesis may affect on your results. To be honest, I have seen a lot of students <laughs> that basically, because many statistical softwares, the P value that is calculated is based on the two tail, like a SPSS. Their hypothesis was directional, but the P value that they have is based on non-directional. So the point is that, please make sure, first of all, you understand and you define the type of hypothesis in your analysis. Second, please use the correct p-value according to that hypothesis. That is my advice. Clear? Yes. Remember, what I'm sharing with you, probably you can't find it in any tutorial uh, in, a, in a YouTube, because in most of the YouTube video, they just teach you the procedure, how to do the analysis. But this all came through the experience. I combine methodological aspect with the statistic. This is the point, correct? Techniques, you can learn it. I'm, I'm not worried about the techniques, because later, if you want to do if you want to learn more advanced statistical analysis, a lot of tutorial videos are available. You can learn it. 
but none of a few of them maybe i'm not sure i, I did not watch uh, all all of them but a few of them maybe discuss about this critical point and see how it affects on your interpretation if i use this p value to interpret my result i will i, I, I would say that no significant results but it is significant why? Because my hypothesis is basically was directional. And then I have to divide it by two. In SPSS, some techniques, some, uh, uh, can you see here? Analyze, correlate, bivariate. Can you see here? Two-tailed, one-tailed. Some, some of a statistical tests, especially for the relationship, they have one-tailed and two-tailed, but not all a statistical tests, a few of them. So, uh, for example, this is another software uh, where is it? Okay, here. So look at here, this is the, as it can be seen here, this, this software is smart PLS for PLS analysis. Again, you have this option, test type. One tail or two tail. But some softwares, for example, like Emus, the p value, there is no any options. The p value is only based on the two tail. So when you run the analysis, when you run your model, for example, the p value, the system, I, I, I don't care about the analysis. Don't, don't worry, don't stress yourself. I, I just want to show you something else. So now, if you look at estimates, the p-value that you have here, this p-value is two-tailed p-value. Look at here, two-tailed p-value. So that's why if you want to convert to the one tail, you have to divide it by two. So many softwares, they don't provide the, 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 the two, two tail, sorry, one tail or one-sided p-value. Any questions? No question? Thank you. <clears throat> so now we move to the second test. You have two samples. Two samples can be independent or can be paired. We want to compare two samples. OK, two groups. Can you tell me what is the difference between independent and paired sample? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Oh, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For the independent samples, we don't match the samples. For pet is for the match samples. Like before Can you and give after. Can you give me some example? Um, pre and post treatment. Pre, pre test and post test is a yeah. paired sample, right? Dependent sample. Can you give me some example for independent sample or independent group? Um, to measure the the height between male and female in in the yeah. UM campus. Male and female, Malaysian, non-Malaysian, correct? Rural, urban area, local, international, low income, high income, case control, intervention group, experimental groups, all this kind of example for the two independent groups. Two independent groups means the a subjects only can be under one category. A subject cannot be in both category. But when you do a pretest retest, a subject can be in both, what do you call it? Pretest and post test. And each subject has two observation, two measure, right? So that's why we call it paired sample or match sample. So let's to do it. Very simple. Now we, we speed up the, the teaching the techniques. So back to this data set, as you can see here, we have gender. Something wrong. Can you see my screen? Yes. 
Okay, okay let me to close all these windows. I think a lot of windows open. I need to close all of them, especially for the this data. I don't need it. I don't need it. I keep only the data sample one. Okay, so in this data, suppose that I have case and control groups, right? So this is a real study. Uh, in this study, one more thing, if you want to access to descriptive statistic, you don't need to go to analyze descriptive frequency. If you just right click and do descriptive, then you can easily find uh, what you call it descriptive statistic. In this study, we have 108 control and 108 intervention. So now we want to compare, my hypothesis is, is to compare the age, this is the age of respondents. I want to compare the age of respondents between group, case and control, control and experimental, sorry. Okay, first of all, I have to check the normality. Age is quantitative, right? Since age is quantitative, still I have to use the parametric test. But first of all, we have to check the normality. So what I, what I need, what should I do? I go to analyze, SPSS, explore, under explore, the age, age is A1, as dependent list, but remember, that's the point. Now you want to compare the age for two groups. Then you need to nor check the normality of age for each category of group, not together all. So that's why the group should be under factor list, under plots, normality plot with test, and run it. Okay, I just copy. Let's do have a look at the box plot. What do you think? Fast. Data are normal or not? Normal. Yes, finish. It's very, it's an obvious that data are normally distributed, that's all. So the age is distributed between control and intervention. Now, what I need to do, I want to compare between two groups. According to this guideline, we need to go, two groups are independent, control and experiments, because a person, a subject, can be either in control or intervention. Cannot A person cannot attend to all these wings or arms. So what I need to do, independent sample t-test. Okay, go ahead. Analyze. Analyze, compare mean, independent sample t-test. Groups is grouping variable. But we know that groups are identified by one and two. So that's why define the groups. Group one, one, group two, two. Continue. And then A1 as test value. Clear? Yes. So what shall I do? What shall I do? Okay. No, I don't. I don't want to click OK. I don't want to click OK. Any alternative? Options. Options? Nothing. Ninety-five percent confidence. Nothing. I want to teach you a new thing. Okay, paste. What does it mean? When you paste, you, you can see another environment, and this is the syntax, right? What is the benefit of syntax? The syntax actually is the code, the code for your analysis. You can always keep and save these codes. This codes, this syntax, if I select it and run it, then I can see the results. But the problem, the point is here. What is the point? So if I save this syntax, look at here. I save this syntax. 
in my desktop. I this syntax syntax for the t test for the age. So I save it. Close. So remember, I open my data next day. I came to office. I open my data. And then I go open. Suppose that I add some new cases. I clean my data and I have to repeat the whole analysis. So what shall I do? I open to data syntax. I open the syntax. And select it and run it. So you don't need to be worried because all remember this is the history of your work. OK, let me to show you actually last time, uh, I think a few days ago, I showed to some of my students a huge number of the uh, syntax. So I, I always I always because I, I forgot sometimes to uh, what do you call it? The, sometimes even in the best situation, we forgot after a few months what we have done, right? As it can be seen here, this is a syntax. Correct? So, but for each syntax, I know what is that because I skip this syntax for each variable. For example, this is for the age. This is for the, for example, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. This is for the uh, C, cis. This is the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. This is pulse rate. This is diastolic. This is glucose. This is the HP, homoglobin, and cholesterol. So remember, I save all my syntax. So suppose that I found that one of the analysis is, is, was wrong. So I just select this one, open my data, and run it. Anytime, and look at here, I save all my syntax. So please, remember from now, whatever you do in SPSS, you can save the syntax and you can keep the syntax. Because in the future, maybe you need to repeat some analysis and you forgot the way, the methods, the techniques. So you keep all the syntax. So in this analysis, what I did, first I did the normality test. You remember, this was normality test. I pasted it. So now I save this. So I, I copy paste this one at the beginning. So means first I just, I just put here star, a star, a streak, normality test. This is just description because in the future when I want to check and this is, I just put again a streak and then this is the T test for comparing group for age. That's all. So anyone, any, 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 any time when I open, when I open my syntax, OK, I know Oh, this is the normality test for what? For the A1, A1 was age and groups, so that's fine. Just run it. So this is the normality test. Look at it. Let me to close it. So there is no any any windows open, right? So there is only one data, nothing else. So look at here. I select both, run it. So this is the first part is the result of the normality test. The second part is the result of the independent test. How easy? <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it saves your time, especially I had a student last time and he said that the examiners in the VIVA ask her, ask her to exclude, if I'm not mistaken, a subcategory of subjects who are aged below 20 and then they ask do, to do the all analysis again. Suppose that the whole thesis, nothing was wrong. The only thing was that the, 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 the examiner requested from my students uh, to remove the subjects below 20 years old and run the analysis only among subjects who age above 20. So what what was the point? Everything was correct, but what in, she needed to report, repeat all the analysis from the beginning. But thanks God, we kept all the syntax, what, what we did. We opened the data. We opened our data. And then suppose that we remove these 10 subjects who are aged below 20. And then we open our syntax and then we run it. Finish. You got it? 
Yes, doctor. Okay, remember in the future, uh, sometimes maybe you need to go back to your data and also do some extra work correction. So please make sure that you keep the syntax. Okay, any questions? So still we have another 33 minutes to finish the morning session. So let's go to interpret the result of the t-test because our intention was to analyze this data. So now we analyze the t-test data. So we go back to these results. So let me to copy these tables in Excel file. Easy for me to edit and explain and write something for you. Select, select, right click, copy. And then go back and here paste. So this is descriptive statistic. How much is the age in control? 28.7. How much is the average age in intervention group? 30. Are they different? Yes. But are these differences statistically different or not? So remember, the t-test has two parts. The first part is one of the assumptions. T-test has two assumptions. One assumption was normality of data. The second assumption is the homogeneity of variance. You remember a standard deviation actually is, uh, is a kind of variation, right? So first of all, we need to check whether the variation in these two samples are same or not. Because under, under uh, assumption of the t-test, as you can see here, there are two type of assumptions. Two type of t-test, sorry. One t-test, one, one, one t-test, so this is the t-value. This t-value is, can be reported when the variances are assumed. When the variances are not assumed, then you have to use another test, which is called t-prime. So remember, In a statistic, we have two t value. One is called t test, normal t test. The other is t prime test. The name of the other name for the t prime is Welch test. Welch test can be used when the variances are not same. So if the standard deviation, actually this reflect the variance. If these two value are not same, then you need to use T prime or Welch for comparison of the mean. If the variances are same, then you can use the T test. So that's why we have T value and another column is in this example, they are same, correct? So this is T and this is T prime. But we don't know which one we have to report, which one we have to use. So to, to identify whether we have to report the T or T prime, then we need to look at the variance differences. If, the, if this test is called, this test is called Leven test for equality of variance. So this is Leven test. If this test is not significant, so means the variances still are same. But if this p value is less than 0. Point, 0 0.05, then you need to use the second line. As I mentioned, this is T and this is T prime or Welch. So the mean difference between control and intervention, how much is the mean difference? The mean difference is 1.84. 
And is it significantly different between control and intervention? So which p-value should be reported, the first or second one? So the variances are same or not? This p-value is not significant, right? So that's why we ignore the second line. If this p-value is more than 0.5, still go straight. If this p-value is less than 0.5, go down. Cookbook. So again, if p-value of leave and test is more than 0 0.05, go straight. If p-value is less than 0 0.05, go to second line and report the second line. Clear? Yes. 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 Any question? No. So now let's go and check the hypothesis here. So my hypothesis is in this. Is yes. Is it okay if I ask a question? I'm just wondering if the T prime is also not significant, what should we do? Okay, remember. We, now we have not discussing about the T value. We just identify right now which one should be used. That's all. Now we want to interpret these results. So in some in some situation, let me to show you. Maybe I have another factors. Let me to do something. Uh, I want to do some modification. Maybe it affects. In this study, both T and T prime are same. That's why maybe you confuse because of that. Now, uh, let me to show you something else. Look at this study. So, the equality of variance is significant or not? Is it significant or not? No, thank no. you. Significant or not? No. 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 Yes. It is, not, it is not significant. So when it's not significant, I can assume that the variances are equal, right? So means the variances are equal. Go straight. Don't go down. So look at here. The T value and T prime value are different, so right? So the P value here and here sometimes are different. So you need to understand that how this T and T prime should be used. So the first P value, the first P value ref shows the equality of variances. If the variances are equal, means the P value is not significant, means we need to report only the first line. But if the p value in the, the first p values assume that, just assume, just assume, right, that this p value is 0 0.0. So this p value is significant or not? Significant. So which t value should be reported, the first or second line? Second line. Yes, Second line. that's all. Why? Because this p-value shows that the variances are not equal. So that's why we have to follow the same. Second. Yes, that's all. Clear? Yes. Okay. So, but we haven't started. We haven't discussed about that. So this is only we identify uh, what exactly we have to do. <laughs> now, According to these results, the p value is not significant. So then we report this t value and this p value. 
According to this p-value, the difference between control and intervention is significant or not? This difference, which is 2.1, is it significant or not? Yes. Yes. Significant. So means if we repeat again and again and again and again and again this study, always there will be a difference between minus 37 to minus 0.22. So means this value will not be zero. This is 95% confidence. Correct? Okay, so this is independent t-test. That's all. And now we move to the pair t-test. What is the pair t-test? We have two samples but they are matched, they are paired. The typical example is pre-test, post-test. Everybody got to a score before and after. So if you look at this example in my data set, I have pre and post score, right? Before and after, for example, intervention and my intervention for example was a training education program right so my my let's to write down the research hypothesis help me suppose that you are my supervisor and I'm, I'm your students what shall i do hypothesis zero hypothesis okay what is the research question RQ, write down your research questions. What should I write? Is demands for post-tests uh, more than pre-tests? Yeah, the, re the research question is that whether the post is more means than pre, okay, when I want to write the questions, I can convert it that whether the intervention is effective or not, right? So, indirectly, when the intervention is effective, means the post score should be more than pre, right? Yes. So, Sometimes the research questions can be converted to another, what you call it, form of presenting, presentation. So it means, don't say that, is there any difference between post-score and pre-score, or post-score is more than pre-score? Just try to make it a bit nice. It means you can say that, my question is that, whether these intervention programs can reduce significantly the stress among the subjects, because, in this study, if I'm not mistaken, let me to check because I'm not sure. This score, this, yeah. Actually, this is stress, this pre B is a stress score. So means if I want to come, if I'm, let me to check first. Yeah. So as you know, this, this is a stress. Pre score, a stress and post stress and my intervention is one is a kind of uh, what do you call it psychotropy to to remove the stress and to reduce the stress correct so what is my research questions the research questions does this intervention significantly reduce the stress or not correct Agree or not? This is my questions. So when I want when I want to convert it to the research objective, what shall I do? I have to say that okay, according to the null hypothesis, there is no there is no difference between a stress as pre and a stress at post. But my alternative hypothesis is that the stress of pre is more than 
stress at post. Correct? So this is directional or non directional? Directional. Okay, this directional. is directional. Thank you very much. So now this is hypothesis, non hypothesis, and this is alternative hypothesis, right? So what I need to do? I go to a statistical test according to the okay. I have two groups paired quantitative. Are they normally distributed? We assume that it is normally distributed. We don't want to repeat because now you know all that this is one of the requirements and everybody need to check the normality test of data. Correct? So then easily click OK, go to analyze, compare mean, paired sample t test. OK, so we want to see the differences between post and pre. No matter which one you put uh, first. This is the differences of pre and post. So OK, so now look at here. This is descriptive statistic. Let me to copy this table in Excel. It is easy for me to. So now how much is the score at pretest? The stress score among the subjects, 206 subjects, was 3.35. And after intervention, it was reduced. Oh, good. So means my intervention was able to reduce the level of stress, right? Agree? Yes. But, but the point is that, is this difference statistically significant or not? We go to the diff look at here. This is the differences. How much is the differences between this and this? Minus 0.37 is reduction. Correct? So this reduction is significant or not? Significant. Why? Because it is less than 0 0.05. But remember, this hypothesis was directional, right? But the p-value here is what? Two tail. tail. So what shall I do? I need to go two. and calculate this p-value divided by two. This is my actual p-value. Of course, it's still still very small, right? But let's do. So still, this p-value is zero, zero, zero. But remember, in the actual, in the real situation, sometimes this p-value maybe it's significant or not significant. Suppose that my p-value is 0 0.98. So you say that it is not significant. But when you convert it to the tooth one tail, the one tail, it is significant. Clear? Yes. Good. So now we covered this statistical test. And now we move to the more than two samples. So uh, for more than two samples, we use the analysis of variance. Comparing of mean analysis of variance. Remember, if you have three groups, if you have three groups and you want to compare between these three groups or three treatments, for example, and you don't need to, you don't know anything about ANOVA and you just want to use the t-test. How many t-tests should I use for two groups? A with B, A with C, and B with C. How many tests? Three tests. Three. If you, suppose that if you have four groups, how many tests you need to do to compare among all these four groups? A with B, A with C, A with D, B with C, B with D, and C with D. So how many times? Six times. So as you can see here, by increasing the number of groups, the number of t-tests that you need to apply will be also increased. And the another issue, 
we we do not uh, we cannot uh, we ad we don't advise actually to use this uh, t test when you have more than two groups. The problem is first increasing the number of t tests, but the main problem is the accuracy of the test because when you compare group A and group B, the accuracy of compare comparison will be different when you compare A with C. So the accuracy of co this comparison and this comparison will be, will be different. So means it's OK, let me to give you a very simple example. Suppose that I have three students. And one I, and then at the end of semester, I want to do a stat exam, right? For these questions, for these students, I give 10 questions. 10 questions at the easy level. This students, I give these questions, two part questions, 10 questions easy. And five practical questions. And the last poor students, I give him 50 questions at the difficulty level, very difficult, and also 10 practical questions. So is it fair to is it fair to compare their mark together? For example, these questions out of 100, these students got 95, these questions got 60, and this question, this student, sorry, take 20 score. Is it fair that we pass this student and fail this student? No. No. Why? Why? Because the standard is yeah, different. Because, because the, the measurement, I mean, the, the test that we have used to compare them are not same. So in ANOVA, when you compare A and B and compare A and C and B or C, you are, you are using different criteria. Same here. It is not only because of the number of tests. It is based on the accuracy. So that's why the, the, the statistician introduced a new technique, which is called one-way ANOVA. I don't want to, to talk about details of one-way ANOVA. Straightforward, I want to teach you how to analyze your data. But the one-way ANOVA is working based on the, the variance, the total variance among groups. How much is the variance caused between groups and how much of the variance is within groups? That's why we compare these two variants and then we identify whether groups, this, suppose that this is the treatment. Treatment one, treatment two, treatment three. And this is the subjects. We want to see whether the variance caused by the treatments compared to the variance within groups are same or not. Okay, forget it. Just let's to do this, this the, the, what do you call it, the comparison among groups using the one ANOVA. Before moving to one way, I don't want to start one way ANOVA before lunch, before the break, uh, but I want to come uh, inform you something. I want to talk about this. So remember, if data is quantitative, normally distributed, for one sample, two, especially for two sample, you use independent and paired sample, right? For independent sample, remember, the sample, two samples should not be too much different in terms of sample size. For the ANOVA, same. I mean, when we compare independent groups, the sample size for independent groups should not be too much different. So means the N, the sample size is another factor. As a rule of thumb, if the large sample size, if the biggest, if the biggest sample size, 
and a smallest sample size. If the smallest sample size is less than half of the large sample size, even data are normally distributed. We do not advise you to use the parametric test. Suppose that I have two groups. Female in my study. Two hundred twenty one female and male in my study is only eighteen. Data is age. Age here is normal. Here also is normal. Age is quantitative data, right? And yes. normally distributed. Shall I use the independent t test? Maybe before I discuss about it, you said yes, because it is normally distributed and the age is quantitative and we have two independent samples. Yes, we have to use, we have to use the t-test. But as you can see here, the sample size under these two independent samples are too much different. So then you cannot use the t-test. Instead of the t-test, later I will teach you, you need to use the non-parametric test, equal non-parametric test. Same as, same as ANOVA. So if you have independent sample tests, remember the sample size should not be too much different. And always make sure that the smallest sample size is more than half of the large sample size. If this condition is satisfied, then you can proceed with parametric tests. Of course, you have to check other assumptions like normality, like homogeneity of variance and so on. Clear? Yes. OK, so now it's almost 12.55, correct? So we have five minutes for Q&A before one. If you don't have any questions, then we can stop now and we can start at 2 p.m. to continue the ANOVA, two-way ANOVA and repeated major ANOVA. Doctor, excuse me. Yes. Mm, just you showed the normality should be tested before the analysis. And uh, the pair t, uh, t test, uh, when we run into the normality, uh, the pre test and the post test data, both of them we should. Uh, yes. Run. All, all the variables pre post should be normally distributed. Yes. Okay, Doctor. Another question is the. the uh, also, the sample size, you know, in intervention study, sometimes we do the pilot study uh, using the small sample size. For example, one uh, group of such as five or six or seven, such so small sample size. For the small sample size, for the pilot study, yes, you are right. For pilot study, always we use a small sample size. But remember, in the pilot study, we, the researcher uh, is it, not, uh, what do you call it, uh, focus on the statistical inference or the statistical significance differences. So mainly we do the pilot study to check the feasibility. The, we understand the barriers. We check our instruments, the protocols, the questionnaires, right? So rather yeah. than look at the significance, that's why in the statistic, in the pilot study, we don't look at the significance or p-value. Mainly we concentrate on the effect size. Okay, okay. So in the workshop, will you emphasize or talk about this part of knowledge? Uh, and tomorrow I will discuss about effect size, yes. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you all. Enjoy your lunch, rest well, but don't eat too much, right? Because when you eat too much, more blood goes to around your stomach. And then after the in the afternoon session, everybody feels sleepy. The statistic a bit sorry. <laughs> what do you call it? Maybe uh, what do you call it? Boring, but please uh, tolerate.
and ex and just uh, be patient. Uh, see you at 2 p.m. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch and Thank rest. You, well. Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Welcome. See you soon.